I'm Mike Vardy. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. And this is the Productivityist Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Productivityist Podcast. I am your host, founder of Productivityist and Productivity Strategist, aka Productivityist, Mike Vardy. Welcome to the public edition of the Productivityist Podcast. Of course, if you are a Patreon supporter, you have your own edition, which includes the entire discussion I'm going to have today with the founder of Stillworks and the author of Do Breathe, Michael Townsend Williams. He's a big believer in mindful productivity, as am I. He's got an app that we're going to talk a little bit about during this podcast episode. And if you are a Patreon supporter, you get the whole meal deal. You get all of our discussion. If you want to become a Patreon supporter, head over to patreon.com slash productivity. Find out all the perks, all the ways you can help support the show. I deliver four bonus episodes every week. Uh, to the Patreon community. There's also a Slack community that people can join so that way we can have lively conversations within the community. It's a lot of fun and if you uh, enjoy the podcast and want to be part of it, then please go to patreon.com slash productivityist and be part of this community that we're building here. Michael Townsend Williams is a doer who likes to be. We have a lot in common in terms of talking about mindful productivity. Uh, His iPhone app, he's the co-creator of the app called Breathe Sync, where it brings your breathing into sync with your heart to reduce stress and improve focus. Uh, He believes the world needs to calm down, and we get a lot more done if we did. I'm right in line with with what Michael has to say. The fact that we have the same first name doesn't hurt either. Uh, So let's just dive into the conversation I have with Michael Townsend Williams here on the Productivityist Podcast. I'd like to welcome Michael Townsend Williams to the Productivityist Podcast. Thanks for joining me today, Michael. It's nice to be here, Mike. Now, notice how he's Michael and I'm Mike. And I was telling him before we started, I said, when people call me Michael, I wonder what I've done wrong. It's what my, I mean, it's either Michael or or worse, Michael Ryan. And that's a, that's what my mother yeah. used to say. And I'm like, oh, so yours is, our, I mean, would, you, would your mother call you Michael Townsend? No. Um, no, she would have called me Michael Williams, actually. But T- Townsend was a, a name that came from getting married. Ah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, see, I... Well, having a child before I was married, so I actually took my son's name. Right, oh, oh, wow. See, see, my wife's maiden name is Morris, and she's like, why don't you just take my... my Michael Morris just didn't... I didn't like... I mean, I love alliteration normally, but Vardy just, for some reason, is like, okay, well, that stands out a little bit more than Mike Morris. I think there was a picture for the St. Louis Cardinals or something like that that was named Mike Morris, so... Yeah. Um, I, I, used to be, I used to be called Michael by my mom, but mm-hmm. then Mike, Mike when I played rugby, mm-hmm. and then Mick when I played football. That makes sense. I never got called Mick. Um, Mikey a few times, but never Mick. I guess that's probably a UK thing, right? A UK thing, Mick. I think yeah, it's Irish thing. Yeah, Mick. Irish. Right, right. Uh, so let's dive in. Let's st- first off, why do I have you on the show? Because I mean, you you you're you, you've got a lot of really cool things going on. But Stillworks.org is your website. You've got a book uh, that is called "Do Breathe, Calm Your Mind, Find Focus, Get Stuff Done," um, which is, I think, a pretty like i mean reading just reading that title makes me feel so much i'm like i want to read this book because and i haven't I, honestly i haven't had a chance to read it yet but it's one of those ones that i definitely want to pick up it's published by the do book company so tell me um what what caused you let's talk about the book first what was the reasoning behind writing this book because there are a lot of productivity style books out i mean i've written them there's a few others that are out there yeah. what 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 caused you to write the book and what's one of the differentiating factors you think that your book offers I guess I, I come from a background in advertising, 
uh, and I worked up until 2002 for big, big, big ad agencies. And I call it the t- my time of obsessive doing. And I was great at getting stuff done, but um, I was very stressed in the process. And, and a lot of the doing was what I would call institutionalized doing. It happened because I had clients and people nagging me to do stuff. And I dropped out of advertising um, because in 1998, my, my brother sadly fell from 15th floor balcony in Kuala Lumpur and died. Oh, wow. And that sort of tragedy meant the last few years in advertising for me were, 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 were difficult times and made me realize that this obsessive doing and stress wasn't really how I wanted to leave, leave my, um, lead my life. And, and during that time, I fell in love with, with yoga and slowly morphed from an alcoholic ad man into a yoga teacher. And I think that that, that that was then the beginning of my second phase of my life, which was a time of obsessive being. And um, I loved my yoga, I still do, my meditation, mindfulness practice. I ran workshops and continue to do workshops, retreats and courses and things uh, in that field. But after about six years of a life of being, I realized I wanted to start doing stuff as well. And that got me into the work of David Allen, who I'm sure you, you know yep. well with getting things done. He's been, he's been on the show before too, actually. Lovely man. Well, I, I met him in London a couple of years back. And um, uh, yeah, he's, he's a wonderful man. And I think what really opened my eyes was when he talked about having a mind like water. And really up until then, I'd really thought that life was about being, not doing. So there's a phrase that, that, that a lot of yoga teachers use, that's we're human, human beings, not human doings. And I thought really a book like Getting Things Done, you know, that's about doing, that's not what, what I'm at. But I picked it up because I wanted to start moving on, on things that mattered to me. And when he talked about a mind like water, I thought this was going to be like a book on, on meditation. And I suddenly realized that there were two sides sides to this coin of being and doing, and they could both work together. So over the last six years, I guess, I've been playing with how to maintain well-being whilst um, doing more. And that led to me uh, creating a mindfulness course, um, creating the app that I'll talk about later, BreatheSync. And um, to talking about my journey at a thing called the Do Lectures, which is a sort of cool, funky TED type thing held in Wales and also now also held in California, Costa Rica and Australia. And I did a talk at the Do Lectures and afterwards they came up to me and said, we love this story of um, moving from doing to being and then working on these two things together. Um, could you Could you write us a book about that? So I think guess where, where the book is different to normal productivity books is it's really the book that a lot of publishers had problems with because it's a book about well-being and well-doing. Mm-hmm. And, and they would say, well, what, what part of the bookshop is it going to go in? <laughs> they, do, they don't know where to position it. Yeah, yeah. Is it going to go in the well-being and self-help area or is it going to go in the sort of startup entrepreneur um, productivity area? And the truth is it's, it's a book for both. It's a book for, for doings that, doers that forget to be and beings that forget to do. Now, one of the things, I mean, obviously listeners to the podcast here know that one of my phrases is stop doing productive, start being productive. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a, I mean, it's funny when you go through your site, I mean, there's a lot of uh, symmetry between and a lot of alignment between what you and I talk about now. Um, yeah. But you're definitely more into the, the yo- like you were a yoga teacher and you're into mindfulness. Yeah. I talk about thoughtful and mindful productivity, obviously, with, mm. with the kind of stuff I do. But tell me what brought you, like what... The, the idea of breathing, because we're going to get into the, the app a little bit, but okay. what role breathing has to play in, in, you know, making sure that people are not just doing, but doing right. Yeah. Well, I think maybe the first thing I'd like to say is, is that with yoga, um, I did a two week sadhana intensive at an ashram in France last year, following a book called the Hatha Yoga Padipika. And that's one of the root books that all physical yoga practices come from. And in that book, when you're doing um, your practice, there's a little bit of exercise, but it's predominantly breathing. So we, we ended up uh, towards the end of the two-week period doing three three-hour practices. In those three-hour sessions, we probably do 40 minutes asanas, physical yoga, and over two hours of breathing exercises. So advanced yoga is actually about advanced breathing. And the reason that's the case is because Controlling your breath is a way to controlling your mind and your emotional state. 
So I think that that's the first sort of thing that, that when people think of yoga, they think of, you know, people in lycra and exercise, mm -hmm. when actually advanced yoga is really about controlling the mind, the stilling of the mind. And th there's a crossover, obviously, between that, that goal in yoga of the stilling of the mind and the concept of flow and being in a highly productive, optimal state, when also you have a, a stilling of the mind when you lose yourself in what you're doing. So for me, breathing is at the heart of, of good being and being present, but it's also a fundamental building block of entering into an optimal flow state and being productive. So let's talk about the app a little bit because this kind of leads into how people don't really know how to how to breathe necessarily. And some people, I mean, most people probably don't. Uh, I can tell you, I tried the app and I'm like, really? Have I been doing this wrong the whole time? Um, so first off, I've downloaded the app literally moments before we start recording this. Like I wanted to make sure that I kind of am a newbie that's going into it. So when they get this yeah. app and it's what I think it's it co I think it's four ninety nine US right? I think for the yeah. app or something like that. Um, in Canadian dollars, that's about three hundred and sixty dollars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually five seventy nine. But uh, so, tell me, like the the way it's orchestrated is you cover your the lens and the, and the flash of the camera with your finger, right? Now, what is that yeah. doing? Basically, that's picking up your pulse. So when you put your finger over the camera, the flash goes on, which shines a light through your skin. And we can pick up the subtle color change in the finger from your pulse. So it's, it's a way of picking up your pulse without you having to use an external sensor. Gotcha, gotcha. And then the idea of keeping your finger on there, and, and I think by default it's two minutes. That's what I had. Yeah. And then what happens is it kind of measures your breathing pattern. Now, what I did was I actually didn't breathe the right way to breathe through your belly through your nose for and you've got instructions here we'll put a link to that in the show notes but yeah. the the there's different different ways so like if you're doing one minute or two minutes can you explain like what the different uh, time intervals kind of can do for you in terms of making sure you're monitoring how how well you're breathing or how or your or your well-being quotient as you put it yeah okay First of all, we're not actually monitoring your breathing we're monitoring your heart rate variability. So the concept of heart rate variability is always a tricky one to explain. But I suppose simply put, most of us would have thought that if our heart beats with a really regular rhythm, so it's going with equal gaps, that sounds like a healthy heart. But in fact, a healthy heart is getting faster and slower and faster and slower. So showing that your system is resilient and can cope better. Right. So what, what we do is we're picking up that heart rhythm, the variance in your heart and timing your breathing so that when you're breathing in, the heart rate's increasing. And when you're breathing out, the heart rate's decreasing. Now, that sort of coherent state where these two things are linked happens um, after a period of time in meditation. So after about 10 minutes of meditation, these things will naturally align. Um, and there are other companies that do this sort of coherent breathing like heart math. Mm hmm. Where we're slightly different is that we actually time the breathing based on your heart rate. So most people doing coherent breathing, they just breathe at a regular rhythm and the app will monitor when your heart and breathing become in sync with each other. What we do is we get you in sync in seconds by actually timing the breathing around the heart data so that your breathing and your heart are aligned. And so you start to feel in the zone, in a state of flow much faster than you would do without the app. Right, right. Now, the the other thing that pe people have, like, have you used other tools leading up to this? I know there's Headspace out there and the Muse headband and stuff. What, yeah. what would you find that, I mean, obviously the entry, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher because of cost for some of these things, but have you tried those in terms of trying to get, yeah. align yourself? And what have you found? Yeah, well, well, well I, I know that the founders of Headspace, Andy and Rich, um, I know the people at Calm. I, I know Rohan with the Buddhify app. They're all fantastic apps, but what they're, what they're doing really is bringing into a digital form what people were doing anyway, yeah? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're guided meditation. They're very good for getting people into a better place. But often they, they want you to do five, ten minutes or, or longer periods of time. And also you're listening to someone else. What we wanted to do with BreatheSync was to create something that worked um, with technology. So, so actually we're doing things with BreatheSync that previously you'd have to have had external heart sensors and PCs 
So we're making something available that you can only really do with technology. And I think the most advanced technology in BreatheSync is not the actual app itself, but the fact that we're picking up the data from your heart. So your heart is the intelligent technology in BreatheSync. And I just like the idea that a very simple breathing app, which is actually using your inbuilt technology, your own body, to help you get into a good, good zone through biofeedback, um, ultimately is you training yourself. Right. And I think that one of the dangers with guided meditation type things is that you can get attached to someone's voice or get attached to someone else doing the work for you. Right, right. And and I mean, the other thing is, is that if you are, I mean, you may be, like you said, those micro breaks are important because a lot of people have a problem pulling themselves away from what they're doing. You know, they, yeah. they and I mean... It's obviously it's important that they don't try to do this while they're like surfing the internet or anything like that. Like you should be able to take. I mean, I've always <laughs> said uh, when I've when I've dealt with people, they're like, I don't have time to you know step away. I'm like, everybody has 25 minutes at some point in the day. Like there is there's. I mean, yeah. email is a great example. If you check email consistently, surely to say you want 25 minutes of focused work, you should be able to get that. If you can't get that, then you're in the wrong environment. But yeah. I mean, you can take one to three minutes away just to kind of get yourself back in rhythm. And I, and I like what this does. Now, what are some of the other things that you talk? I mean, when I talk about when you, when you, when I talk about mindful productivity, when I I mean, mm. obviously there's a relationship with 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 technology to a certain point, we have to deal with technology, as I was just mentioning, email mm. and stuff like that. What, how do you approach that stuff? Because you obviously integrated some forms of technology with the app, right? Yes. But you did say the most important thing is the organic app within, which would be the heart. Like, what? How do you yeah. kind of walk people through when you say, okay, you know what? Um, how do I be mindful when all these inputs are coming at me all the time? Yeah, well, I think I guess one of the when I got into um, pro the productivity work of David Allen, what what really amazed me was that my meditation practice in improved dramatically once I started actually operating a productivity system. And I realized that if, if you go to a meditation teacher and you've got this background noise when you're trying to meditate, they'll say, we're well, just going to watch the thoughts, they're like clouds, let them pass, and that's all part of the training. But the, the, the truth is that, that, that although that is true, a lot of that stuff is keep, keeps coming into your mind because you're just not dealing with stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so for, for me, um, these two things come together. Actually, if, if you have an organized system where you're not holding stuff in your head, you're capturing stuff, you've got your inboxes sorted out, and you're also processing that, you're reviewing where you are with things, then that's going to lead to an improvement in your mindfulness meditation practice, which in turn is going to help you focus and pay more attention to what you're doing. So the two things work together for me. And I think that, that, that maybe uh, previously when I'd encountered people talking about mindfulness, it was more of a sort of a recovery from stress rather than uh, an integrated part of your day. Right, right. Now, um, let's talk a bit about that, that capturing thing. How do you encourage people to get things out of their head? Like, what do you, what, what tools do you use to kind of make that happen? I mean, obviously you've got an approach in place. Do you have any particular specific tools? Yeah, to use? I, I, I guess, um, I've come back to Evernote in the last um, year. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the main reason for that was I read a great post by, is it Michael Hyatt? Yep. And about how to how to have very few notebooks. Like I have three notebooks. I have inbox, action, and reference, and then handle everything else through tags. And up until reading that post, I'd, I'd sort of struggled with Evernote because I had too many notebooks and I wasn't managing it very well. So I use an inbox in Evernote. I use an inbox in Things, which is my to-do list app of choice. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. That's where I, that's where I stick stuff. I also have a pad. I carry pads around with me. Um, but I have a, have a rule that, that, that if they are, if, if I've captured something, I just stick it in my inbox. I rip the page out or, or take a photograph of the page uh, in Evernote. Um, and then my two key, key tools. Yeah. Think things and Evernote for capturing. And, you know, when you were, I mean, obviously, how do you kind of reconcile where things exist? You know, I mean, you've, have you been, you, are you a guy that's tinkered with stuff in the past? I mean, I'm sure that as you were growing your, your, your ability to kind of be more productive, how did you kind of fine tune and say, okay, 
Um, this is what's working for me. Let's eliminate this other stuff. Do you find it not only like, how did that happen for you? And also do you find that there's still temptation occasionally to be pulled into this <laughs> shiny new thing that's yeah, shown up? There's, yeah. There's, 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 there's always temptation. I think that, um, pretty much from when I read, um, getting things done six years ago, I've been with the same app things, right? Which is which is which is great because I know for a while Cultured Code didn't do many updating. I think Sync was a bit of an issue. So yeah, yeah, I went through I went through the, that that awkward year mm-hmm. when I nearly jumped ship um, and I was syncing via Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I went through that little little bit. What I would say is that uh, because I coach quite a lot of people in productivity, I do use other apps um, sure. for uh, research. So. I've used Asana, Nosby, um, the the one that picks up Gmail tasks on a iPhone, is it, is it Go Tasks. You probably used OmniFocus at some point in time or another. I have used OmniFocus, um, and what I mean, I've, I've used so many of them. I mean, I, I, yeah, I have you and me both. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've, you know, you know what I mean. There's so many of them. Um, I've played around with Task Paper. I've um, what else have I got here? I tell you one one that I do do actually use um, along with things, and that's Clear. Right, oh, the one by Real Max Software. Yeah, and, and what I what I use that for? I use that for a scratch. What I call scratch lists. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if I'm suddenly doing a quick and dirty um, uh, shopping list. Um, I like using Clear because I can just quickly swipe it and tick it all off while I'm there. If I'm doing website updates and suddenly there's lots of really sort of granular things I want to keep track of, I'll use Clear. Um, So things is for everything. But if I've got a scratch list, which is definitely going to be done within that session, um, then I use uh, Clear. Have you looked at drafts at all? Do you use drafts for like input? I do have drafts. Yeah, mm-hmm. I do have drafts. So, so I, I guess I have a workflow that if I suddenly have a some, something comes to my head when I've got my phone, I'll put it into drafts, uh, into the drafts inbox, and then I'll send it from there to Evernote or Things or wh- wherever it needs to, to, to go to. I also, um, when my wife texts me a shopping list, um, and I get that as a text message. Mm-hmm. I then copy that into drafts because I can then send it um, as a list into, into clear. Right, right. So, 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 so I use drafts. Um, I don't use it heavily, um, but but uh, um, it's on my there. Bottom, it's there when you need it. It's where I need it. I mean, I mean, the bottom row of the four apps on my iPhone is Sunrise. Yep, same. Mailbox. Uh, I use I use Dispatch for my email. Yeah, so I, so I have also have dispatch, but I have mailbox there, and then I have drafts, and I have things. Yeah, so me, it's it's the same, except I've got Todoist as my task manager, and I've got uh, again, uh, actually, I don't even, I have Slack in the bottom. Actually, I don't have my email client in the in the. Uh, I yeah. use I use Launch Center Pro to get access to my email uh, pretty quickly. So it's interesting because I mean, again, you're using these apps with intention. I think that's another thing that people lose focus on is that when they're so busy that they don't pay attention to what they're trying to do in the first place. How important yeah. is intention to you and how do you kind of teach and, and walk people through the idea of fostering those intentions so that they can actually move forward with them? I think the ideal way is is to do a full um, productivity implementation. So you go through not only getting control, but also about the perspective so when someone, re- I think and this is what happened to me really, when I got into productivity, I was very clear about my purpose. Mm-hmm. And when you're clear about your purpose, your values and your vision, then, then you want to have the execution framework to make it happen. Right. So I think that's the thing that really helps with intention. Um, and, and I talk about this in the book when talking about focus, because focus is about training your ability to pay attention but it's also about your intention. I think I don't know where the quote comes from, but but you know when they talk about if you're going to put a ladder up against the, a building and start climbing a ladder, make sure you put it up against the right building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and so so I think uh, attention and intention they, they, they come together. Right, right, absolutely. You, are you a big believer in like segmentation of things? So I mean, I don't work life balance to me is kind of. I mean, I think work-life integration yeah. is probably what we're looking at. Are you are you a guy that kind of says, okay, this is where this exists and this is where this exists because your mind can point to it much faster as opposed to no. let me no. search like crazy? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, um, 
I'm going to a festival next week with my son doing a talk about the book, uh, Best of All in the Isle of Wight. And um, the bit where I do the my work there, doing a talk and a workshop, will actually be something that I'm looking forward to. And the bit around that, which other people would call pleasure, I'm sort of dreading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, no, I think for, for, for me, um, the, the, there's, there's no differentiation. And um, I, I agree with you about the word balance. And I think this is also applies not only to work life, but also our body. We keep, we keep talking about the body being in balance. The body's never in balance. It's not designed to be in balance. It's designed to be dynamic. Mm -hmm. And it's how, how we manage the dynamism of our lives, not the balance. Right, right. So, I mean, and that's one I, t I wrote about uh, shifting. I think, sh I mean, you, if you're driving a vehicle, right, yeah. you don't balance the gears because you're not going to get very far. <laughs> you shift yeah. gears. And sometimes you're going to have to shift into high gear because you want to keep up with traffic. And if you go too slow, then you're, or you want to get somewhere faster. But in some cases, you're going up a big hill and you're going to have to, you're going to have to downshift so that you can make it up that hill. And I think there's yeah. no difference, I think, when it comes to living. And again, I think that, do you think that people put all their eggs in one basket? Do you think they say, okay, I, I, I'm going to focus on work and hope that career, the home balances. I mean, I'm sure you've kind of answered this to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, how do you like, and how do, again, how would you recommend that when people do that, that they kind of break free of it short of, and something that they can do today that will, will help them as opposed to like a long-term solution. Like the first thing they can do to kind of say, okay, look, I'm catching myself in this thing. What's something I can do to break that pattern? I think I think the most important thing you can do is, is to be really deeply honest with yourself. And what I mean by that is most of the time we just don't know. So, you know, I, if you ask, are you doing the, the right job? Are you, are, you, are you in the right relationship, whatever? The truth is often that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And what most of us do when we feel uncomfortable and we're not sure about something, we sort of just grab an answer because it's so uncomfortable to stay with that not knowing. So if there was one tip, it would be, if there's something in your life that you're really not sure about, get used to saying you don't know. I, th I think there's actually even a quote in the Talmud about, yeah, teach your tongue to say, I don't know. I think I heard that from James Victor. Mm -hmm. And be okay with that as well, because that's the other problem. We'll, we'll, we'll be okay with it, but, but the truth is you won't be okay with it at first. Right. That's, that's why you run from it, and that's why you, you, you make stuff up. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so be honest with yourself when you don't know something, feel that discomfort, breathe into that discomfort, because actually if you breathe into the discomfort of not knowing, it becomes something that you can um, uh, hold on to. And then realize that, that, that it's in, in your imagination. And then, and, then, and then once you start opening up that authenticity and that honesty, then you start seeing opportunities in front of you. Because the reason that you're not seeing the opportunities that life has for you is because you have decided that you know when you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael, this has been a great conversation, and uh, I want to make sure that people get a chance to look at your book and find more out about you, so if that we haven't covered already. Uh, and for those who are listening to the Patreon edition of the show, if you're not listening to the Patreon edition of the show, then you missed a, a few things that we discussed in the interview, and you can head over to patreon.com slash productivityist to check out and, and maybe subscribe and become a patron and, and hear all the goodies that we talked about today, as well as have some perks and, and other cool things that we do, including some bonus podcast episodes every week. But Michael, when you are not, uh, you know, when you're not either, when you're not breathing, <laughs> when you're not breathing, uh, which you are all the time, but where can people find you uh, and learn more about you? And of course, BreatheSync as well. Yeah. So, so my website is stillworks.org. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at mtownsendw. Um, you can find on the website stillworks.org links to my book, which is Do Breathe, Calm Your Mind, Find Focus, Get Stuff Done. And you can also find links there to my app, which is for iPhone, a biofeedback breathing app called Breathe Sync. So that's breathe with an E, space, sync, S-Y-N-C. Um, but yeah, I, I hang on Instagram. Instagram and Twitter are the sort of places you'll find me most at mtownsnw. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me this week on the show. And uh, I got to get better at. Uh, I got to get. I got to start using this app more because I, I like it. I, it was really quite pleasant. So I'll be, I'll be checking into finding out what sort of scores you're getting. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks again for joining me this week, everybody. I hope you enjoyed 
what Michael and I spoke about. You can go to stillworks.org to learn more about Michael Townsend Williams. And if you want to learn more about Productivityist as a whole, go to productivityist.com and you can learn about all the stuff that we're doing there as well. Want to support the podcast? I know I talked about this off the top of the show, but it bears repeating. Head over to patreon.com slash productivityist and you can learn about how you can do that there as well. That's it for this week. I'm Mike Vardy, host of the podcast, founder of Productivityist and Productivity Strategist, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. We'll see you next week. Mm